Bible sponsored by the MFA program in creative writing. Um, a little bit of business before we get started, just to let you know that um, it's a long day of events. Some people will come for some, and some people will come for all. Um, some of you may be registered for our dinner and story, which happens later on. Um, we have two panel discussions in the afternoon. At five o'clock upstairs, we have some really interesting tables set up uh, with, you know, sort of an opportunity to network, but also become informed a little bit more deeply about some of the issues we're going to talk about today. So certainly if you stay for the panels, please join us upstairs at five for some of that tabling, at which point also the cocktails will begin for the dinner. So if you're inclined, please join us for that as well. If you're signed up for the dinner, I'm going to check you in to make sure we know, that, you know who, who's going to the food line and who's not. Um, the dinner, uh, we have sort of a list, and there's still room. If you didn't sign up and you want to go, please let me know, and uh, I'll put you on the list, and I will give you a piece of ribbon that says happy birthday, and that's your pass. And if we run out of that, I've got one that says welcome, sweet baby. Uh, <laughs> these, these will be your passes to dinner. Um, so the MFA program is really happy to sponsor the Food Justice Conference. Um, we, we like to find ways to use our, our ability to communicate communicate about things that are really important to our community and to the world. So that's why a creative writing program gets involved in food justice or any kind of social justice issue. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce the moderators for our two panels. So I'm going to begin by introducing the moderator for our first panel. And then um, I, I just want to make sure that I've said that I'm so grateful to our panelists all for being here. Uh, but I'm especially grateful to the moderator of our first panel uh, for working with us to create today's event. Uh, Beth Rado is an attorney and a professor of sustainability action here at Manhattanville College. Uh, she's, she's put a lot of effort into helping us put this day together, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, she's the sort of person whose uh, tireless activism truly moves me to try to be a better me uh, when you look at the things that this woman's been involved with and done. She's been engaged in energy and environmental conservation issues uh, at the state and local levels. She's been a player in the anti-fracking movement. She's chaired the Committee on Energy and Agriculture and the Environment uh, for the League of Women Voters for the State of New York. She's a member of the Town of Marinex Sustainability Collaborative. And she's late, lately, she's focused her, her considerable energy on fighting hunger in Westchester County. So we have a great panel assembled, uh, thanks much to her efforts, and I'm happy to introduce Beth Rado to you, and she will introduce the rest of the panel. Lori, thank you very much, and welcome to everybody here. Have you all had a chance to say hello to one another? There you go, all right. So is anyone hungry? There are cookies outside. I don't want anyone to be hungry. There's, uh, there's some, some, okay. There's no reason for hunger. We're going to talk about that today. Uh, just for a show of hands, I know folks here, but you don't know necessarily know one another. How many people here are, are full-time students? OK, that's, well, that's great. All right. And, and how about part-time students, part of the time? Educators? Other workers? And who's working on food justice issues here? OK, all right, so that's very helpful to us. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to speak for a few minutes, and then I'm going to introduce our uh, very inspiring speakers. And then we're going to have a chance to ask questions. What we're going to do is if you've got a question, you'll uh, you know, ask it down here. We're taping this uh, for other folks who can't be here today. And um, so just know that uh, you know, if you come down here, you may be on camera. But what we will do is we'll repeat the question. Uh, so that people who are watching this at home um, can, can hear. Um, so imagine that in these two cups, we've got the world's supply of food. And this illustrates the amount of food that goes to waste. 40% of the food that we produce goes to waste across the continuum. It never gets eaten. Uh, either it never makes it off the farm, or it gets tossed by a typical supermarket, or at home. And yet, uh, in Westchester, one out of every five people is food insecure. 
So, and, and um, Leslie Gordon's going to speak more specifically about that, but just to st statistically, um, you're, you're raising your hand. Did you? The United States. Okay. The question was, when, who produces this food? We're speaking about the United States. Um, although there is a substantial amount of food globally that never gets eaten also, but potentially for different reasons. Um, now, so, one in, so that's 200,000 people who are food insecure, and 58,000 uh, of those are uh, children. So, um, Food insecurity, we, the, the, the terms may or may not be used uh, interchangeably. This panel is called hunger. There's another term that's used, food insecurity, and it can mean different things for different people. Think of this in the context that three out of four people um, in the workforce live paycheck to paycheck. That's almost 75%. So that um, you know, if you're a person in the workforce and you have a bad month, if you lose a job, if you're not fully ins uh, insured, if you have a loss in the family, if you have a wedding, if you're putting a child through college, if you're stretching your dollars, that's on one end of the continuum. Or, or, or if you are unemployed and are really more above the poverty line. But, but the, the concept of food insecurity in the economic sense um, really affects a number of people. And it's not only that we are, um, uh, whether or not we have enough calories, it, typically, the, the concept was if we had a certain daily recommended number of calories that we were properly eating. But in fact, that is not necessarily true because people can still have the daily recommended number of calories and be malnourished. Um, you know, those are empty calories, uh, and that may happen if you're a student. It may happen because you like the sugar, oil, salt combination. Um, a statistic that I found, you know, very interesting is that um, it is the impact that our, uh, our, our food consumption has on our health. So the, the projection is that by 2020, 70% of the non-communicable diseases will be, will be related to food. Things like diabetes and um, cardiac issues, I don't, I may or may not include cancer, but that's, you know, a rather remarkable thing to consider. Um, so, and, and by the way, when I talk about three out of every four people who are, are working um, may be, uh, you know, stretched and, and living paycheck to paycheck, also students uh, are on a budget. And um, uh, so they have to conserve what they consume. I know when I was in law school, I, um, I lived on lettuce and potatoes, which I guess in the scheme of things isn't terrible, although it, it became a little bit old after a while. <laughs> So just to put this in context, you know, and think about where we are right now with what's going on with right, the Supreme Court and politically, we're in 2018. 100 years ago, when women were getting the right to vote, before women were getting the right to vote, we were in the throes of World War I. I've got posters over there that I collect. I have a book right here if anyone's interested when the government was issuing posters um, to um, educate people about the need to feed our allies overseas. And it tested Americans' loyalty to country and our fellow man. The challenge involved conserving our food and helping to feed our allies. So if you get a chance when you come down later, you'll see that what we were talking about 100 years ago, we're speaking about again, although it's in a slightly different context. But it showed 100 years ago the selflessness uh, that the government sought from Americans to get through the exigencies of the time. And the government commissioned posters that appealed to, to citizens, and citizens rose to the occasion. We were able to plant gardens. The Victory Gardens came in World War II. Um, but this was voluntary, and people, again, rose to the occasion. So uh, now we're battling a war against a warming climate. Obviously, it's a, it's a different kind of war, but it's one that requires everyone to take action. Food waste, which you'll hear about more in the second panel today, uh, is, the, is the third largest contributor to global warming. So it is imperative from that perspective that we toss less food. And we have a growing disparity of income distribution that will adversely affect our society 
as a whole if we don't properly nourish our next generation, our workforce, our older adults. In short, we have to toss less and feed more. Food insecurity, as I said, um, mentions everything from unhealthy eating habits to filling our, our stomachs uh, to missing meals altogether. Um, so I'm stating the obvious, but when a person, if it's a young person in school or a college student, a person in the workforce, older adults, if we're hungry, if we're not properly nourished, we can't possibly focus on learning, we can't perform a job, uh, we can't stay healthy and, and, and enjoy a quality of life. So what can we do? Well, we can elect legislators uh, to enact laws that address our food supply, and that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Um, we the people make democracy work, and that's not only at the voting booth. And for those of you who have not registered to vote, I have voter registration forms that I'm happy to uh, welcome. And I'm happy to uh, give them to you, or if you have any classmates here, I've got them in English and I've got them in Spanish, and it's really important that people vote. But not only on election day, it's really important that people vote with your consumer dollars. So what does that mean? It means that you shop at supermarkets and you eat at restaurants that have a philosophy and practices in place that figure out how they're gonna present food to you, how they're gonna conserve the food supply, and what they're gonna do with that food supply if it comes to a point where they don't sell it. Are they gonna dump it in a dumpster? Or are they going to make sure that they're feeding people in the neighborhood? Are they gonna be sending it to food banks? And we can actually shift the way our, the people who supply our food do supply our food by speaking to the managers at, at stores and saying, if you don't supply food in this way, you know what somebody else does when we're going to, uh, we're going to shop. We've seen, again, politically, how when people speak out, it makes a difference. And you don't need a lot of people to make a difference. And I think you're going to hear from panelists this afternoon, and I'm looking at people in the audience here. I know them personally. They've made a tremendous difference. So the good news is that thoughtful, enterprising people are addressing hunger and food insecurity and shifting practices can bring all of us more sustainable um, agricultural practices. One more thing I want to say. Patriotism is often linked to military service. But consider that the work of people that you will hear from today and the opportunities open to all of us to make sure that we and our neighbors are properly nourished is the highest form of patriotism. Um, we, can, we can personally incorporate new ways to conserve the food we buy, respect what we purchase, eat leftovers, really, eat leftovers, be creative, and donate the food we don't need to others who do. Uh, you, and, and so uh, without further ado, uh, you've got hand handouts, um, and I can discuss those with you. Um, and we'll put them digitally for people who want to access. I think we'll be able to do that online. Uh, and then you can hyperlink to the various um, uh, sites that I referred you to. Um, so let me now uh, get to our panelists. What I think I'm going to do is interview our panelists all at once, and then um, they'll each have an opportunity to speak to you. Um, all the way on my right is Ashley Kenny, who's currently the Garden Manager and Sustainability Coordinator at Grace Farms Foundation in New Canaan, Connecticut. Ashley has been a food justice educator and sustainability lecturer and previously managed the Jane Goodall Permaculture Garden at Western Connecticut State University. Her years of restaurant management taught her the value of connecting people and nature through locally sourced organic produce, as well as how to manage and diminish the amount of waste produced by large facilities. Ashley's passion lies in helping people to make personal choices that support a more sustainable lifestyle. Ashley currently leads a lecture series called Growing Community and runs a small homestead where she produces maple syrup, has begun a small orchard, cultivates edible mushrooms, and tends to her flock of chickens. Thomas McQuillan uh, is the Vice President of Strategy, Culture, and Sustainability at Baldor Specialty Foods. Is a transformational executive, food sustainability leader, chef, and innovator in systems and operations. Uh, Thomas has more than 30 years of successful business leadership experience and is a major player in the food sustainability movement. In 2015, Thomas joined Baldor Specialty Foods, which is the largest uh, produce and specialty foods distributor in the Northeast. 
to identify a cost-effective way to repurpose the overwhelming amount of food byproduct created by the company's Fresh Cuts facility. Uh, Thomas's SPAR sees, I hope I pronounced that right, a program completely eliminated food waste from Valdor's facility and reinvented the way that people feel about unused food. To my immediately left is Leslie Gordon, who's the president and CEO of Feeding Westchester, which is a not-for-profit organization with a mission to provide good food and eradicate hunger. Prior to joining Feeding Westchester, Leslie served as a key executive at City Harvest, where she led plans to improve food access and nutrition for 500,000 low-income New Yorkers and pioneered a new strategy that doubled the food distributed annually from 30 to 60 million pounds. A fourth-generation resident of Tarrytown, Leslie is a graduate of SUNY New Paltz with a degree in sociology. Leslie is a frequent guest speaker at various organizations addressing issues of hunger, including the National Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Medicine on Seniors and Hunger. Leslie is also a guest lecturer at Fordham University's Master of Science in Nonprofit Leadership Program. And further to my right is Linda Tarrant-Reed, an author, freelance journalist, photographer, and community garden activist. Also, most of Linda's career has been focused on literary pursuits. Linda has recently turned to organic farming, food justice, and food insecurity. Since 2011, uh, Linda has been garden administrator for Grow Lincoln Park Community Garden, which she established in New Rochelle to memorialize the 50th anniversary of the desegregation struggle at Lincoln Elementary School. The 10,000 square foot urban farm is located on the former campus of the school, where residents, churches, and local organizations grow organic, pesticide-free crops in its 60 raised beds. A portion of the harvest is donated to local soup kitchens and food pantries. Linda is a member of the board of directors of the new Rochelle Council on the Arts and the curator of NRCA Rotunda Gallery at New Rochelle City Hall. And Linda's forthcoming book, Discovering Latino America for Pre-Columbian Times to Present Day, will be published soon by Abrams Books. So that's really wonderful. Why don't I turn to Ashley now, and I think what we're going to do is have each of our speakers speak briefly, and then we'll engage in a conversation, and then we'll follow it up with questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beth. That was lovely. How's everybody doing today? I feel really lucky to be on this panel with uh, a lot of people who are very, very accomplished and people whose work I respect. Uh, sometimes when you do what I do, being a, a farmer, um, a lot of the time you're really no pun intended, you're really siloed into this sort of tunnel vision of how much work I have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, and much like everybody else, but I'm also a mother, and I'm also a musician, and I'm also all these other things, but the physical work of it is quite exhausting, and oftentimes it doesn't leave a lot of time to speak with other people who do the same kind of work that you do. I, my best friend's a farmer. I haven't seen her since May, so um, <laughs> yeah. that's what we do. Um, I want to talk a little bit about where I work right now and the work that I do. Um, I put a picture up of Grace Farms in New Canaan. Uh, Grace Farms is not a farm, but it used to be. It's an 80-acre cultural and community center based in New Canaan, Connecticut. It's, um, it is 80 acres, three of which are built upon, and, and 77 are left in perpetuity to be open space. Um, Basically, Grace Farms was designed with the one tenant in mind, which was to not have a front door. So Sana, uh, Sejima Nishizawa, an uh, architecture group from Japan, helped bring this vision to life by creating five glass volumes. The, um, the whole building is glass. Uh, the building you see is called the River Building, and you can visit it six days a week. We're only closed Monday. Grace Farms has five initiatives, and they are nature, justice, community, faith, and art. And each of those has a director and creates programming. I'm under the community uh, sort of set initiative. Um, and it, while Grace Farms has what's called a community garden, it's a different type. And, and I was talking to Lori before about how the word community garden can be very elastic. Um, community garden, the community garden at Grace Farms is 70 different types of fruits, vegetables, and cut flowers, as well as an apiary of bees that I maintain for honey. Um, that 
serves the on-site restaurant at Grace Farms. And since Grace Farms is free, we've made it so that the food that, and we don't allow outside food, so that if it's free for low-income families, the food is very, very inexpensive and accessible to people. It's also farm fresh, rotates, and there's such, I mean, it's, it's wonderful. We serve breakfast and lunch. Um, basically, the, um, we are also a zero waste food facility as a sustainability coordinator there. I made a zero waste. I know the next panel is going to talk about waste, but um, I want to talk about the groups that we work with to make food justice work happen. Um, I was once food insecure. I left my husband of 10 years when my children were very small and all I took was my children. And there was a summer when I was homeschooling them and running restaurants at night when I couldn't provide them with food. And the library that we used to go to had a program for food insecure families where you could go and get a free lunch without your kids knowing that you were getting lunch. And they offered chess games and then you could, oh, here's a lunch, and you would go there three days a week and I would get them food. And that's how I started on this mission. And I said, how can I turn my skills as a farmer, um, which I had grown up doing, into food justice work? And so, um, Basically, that turned into me ending up working for somebody very famous, Dr. Jane Goodall, running the Jane Goodall Permaculture Garden. And I worked with Roots and Shoots, which is Dr. Jane's university-based program. Um, and I spent many hours with Dr. Jane herself, and I feel very lucky to have run that permaculture garden. And that garden was run solely on grants, uh, with a lot of grant writing work. And all of that food either went to the university or to Daily Bread Food Pantry in Danbury, Connecticut. The difference between Daily Bread food pantry that I used to provide for and the one I provide for now is that Daily Bread asks zero questions. You could be a millionaire CEO and lose your job and the very next day stand in line and get food. But the food that comes there is a little bit more erratic because they are just, they don't know how many people they're gonna see. But right now, Grace Farms, 75% of what I grow, which turns out to be about 2,000 pounds a year, goes to the restaurant. And then the other 25%, which last year was about, this is really bad math, I'm a farmer, I'm not a math person. Yeah, <laughs> about 500 pounds, but actually it turned out to be more last year, it was 1,200, so it's not, maybe I should change my numbers. 60% um, also went to person to person in South Norwalk. Person to person looks like a grocery store. And clients can walk in and they have to meet with a counselor first, so you can't just walk in there and get food. But you meet with a case manager and you go in and it's a grocery store and you pick out what you want. They get their food from the Food Bank of Connecticut and supplemented produce and fresh fruits and I also bring in, I also make flower arrangements for the, the clients as well. Um, because it, you know, there's nothing that brightens somebody's day more than flowers. So I made about 65 of those this summer. Um, and uh, I love the work that we do. Last week I got a phone call from them. I, I have an orchard at Grace Farms. I have 28 apple trees and six plum trees. And the Food Bank of Connecticut was out of produce and there was nothing for a person to person to pick up. And so I rushed over there with 50 pounds of apples and I just love that they could call me. I brought over kale and hot peppers and um, arugula and I, I just love that they had somebody to call when the big, the big people couldn't help. It, it's, that's tough to hear that the, I don't know if you know, but food banks collect from the whole state and then food pantries get their food from the food banks. Um, so um, just to sort of wrap things up, I just wanted to say a couple things that food justice to me, I'm also a native Spanish speaker. Um, my family's from Colombia and uh, food justice also means culturally appropriate food for people. It does not mean just growing kale and lettuce and microgreens because that's what we like um, I grow specific varietals of hot peppers that were requested by my clients from Jamaica and from Honduras. I've, I'm growing these things called the quincho peppers from Brazil this year because there was a need for these, these things that seem inexpensive but make, make all the difference to somebody who might not know how to cook with Swiss chard or beets. And I think we have to think about that, that these, that these things that some people are used to getting um, are not for everybody. Um, one more thing, um, to help make us zero waste, we use um, a nonprofit organization in Connecticut that's based out of Norwalk. Now they're completely national. Please look them up. They're called Food Rescue US. 
Food Rescue has developed this super cool app that, uh, let's say we had like all these cookies left over from the event today and nobody ate the cookies. We could, one of us would have the app and you basically, it connects a volunteer food runner to grab those cookies and bring them to a place that needs them right now. It could be a men's homeless shelter. It could be a, a food pantry that's kind of out of food. It could be, um, it could be um, a school, actually. We've had some calls from, from schools in Bridgeport that don't have the, the breakfast that they're required to have. Um, and so Food Rescue has been able to do that with volunteers. And that's a way that I think people can get involved if you can't do the farming, if you can't do, you could be on call all the time. It's like a little four hour window. Take your kids along with you and you grab food from an event, from a college, from a school, from a corporation that had just too many, too much salad and wrap it up and bring it to somewhere that's in need uh, right then and there. So I just wanted to um, mention all those things. I hope you will visit Grace Farms and I hope you will, um, I just, I'm looking forward to hearing other people's stories next to them, so thank you. I'll try to make sure there's no cookies left over before I leave. <laughs> I'm being paid quite a lot of money to speak today, so I, otherwise I would surrender my time because I can listen to you speak all day. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm not in the program. Elizabeth and I spoke yesterday around 1, one o'clock, um, uh, and she said, you know, we kind of finalized that I would join the, the table, and I think uh, one of the reasons that makes a lot of sense is because what, a lot, what you're going to hear today on this panel is a lot of the good work people do uh, to a very large extent on very low incomes, and a lot of low salaries. I work for a for-profit organization. I consider myself uh, very well compensated. And so my work on the food waste side, more, I'm probably much more qualified to speak on that panel than I am this one, allows us to uh, provide food for the food insecure in a very large scale way, a meaningful way, and we do that. Um, just to set up a little bit more of a historical context for you, and you may have contemplated this and you may not have, all of our major religions address food waste in one way, shape, or form. Um, for those of you that may have celebrated Yom Kippur, um, you may not be aware that Leviticus, when the, this holiday was designed, talked about food waste being eliminated, or at least taking assets that you own and giving those to the people in need as a way of uh, paying for your uh, misdeeds of the past year. So it was definitely an embedded part of the culture. There's a wonderful um, New Testament story uh, where Jesus walks into a town and he wants to speak to the people and he realizes that they're not going to pay a bit of attention to him because they're hungry. So he notices that some people have some fish and bread and he multiplies those fish and bread and feeds 5,000 people. Um, you might not be good at counting, but there's one of those New Testament stories that says there were 4,000 people. So obviously we've had a problem with counting as well all the time. But I mention that because I hear a very different story there. I think what the message is is not so much that maybe there was plenty of fish and bread. Maybe Jesus didn't perform any miracle in terms of creating additional uh, bread or fish, but maybe he just recognized that there was plenty of fish to be had. It was just that some people had bread and fish and some people had none. And so by suggesting that they were shared, everybody got to eat. But I think what's really amazing, and I encourage you to look at that reading, the last uh, sentence says, Jesus commands the apostles to pick up what's left over and waste nothing. And I sit there and go, what? That was 2,000 years ago. Why would they waste anything? They're in a desert, for goodness sake. There's no food. Resources are so limited, and yet they had to be told to not waste. So we have a long way to go, yes, but we are unfortunately maybe wired to waste as a great, as a people, as a um, species. Uh, so we really need to dig deep and figure out ways to, to take the assets that we have under our control and share them with others. Um, I'm going to make a very bold statement, and this is just simply true. There is plenty of food in our world to feed everyone. We don't need all this special work to be done. The farms that are growing the food we currently have make, produce plenty of food. What we need to do is be much more purposeful about collecting that food and getting that food into the hands of us, those who uh, maybe aren't food insecure, and those that are food insecure. Um, and so I'm working on some really 
uh, neat projects that I can't get into today in this group, but I'd love for you to jump on my LinkedIn page and you can read about some of them, but I'll just tell you about one. Um, there's a beautiful farm in Milton, New York, Hepworth Farm, run by a family for seven generations. It's now run by two women, Amy and Gail Hepworth. Um, they will grow this year about two million pounds of heirloom tomatoes. Uh, 840,000 pounds of those heirloom tomatoes will go to waste this year. What they do is they sort of look at all those tomatoes and decide those tomatoes are not fit for sale, so those are going to go to compost. So when I heard this story a couple of months ago, I just was crestfallen. and I thought, these are gorgeous tomatoes. And I, we do a lot of business with farms, so I asked them, I'm like, why are you wasting these tomatoes? And I use the word waste in that context. And the farmers are like, we're really not wasting them. They're becoming part of the future of soil. We regenerate. I, I, I get the soil regeneration. I'm totally into that. But I'd much, much rather see somebody eat those tomatoes. And why aren't we eating those tomatoes? And they sort of said, well, we really can't get them from the farm to the people who need them. So I started thinking that there are two solutions, potentially. One, the issue is we have plenty of heirloom tomatoes in August and September. That's no secret. So how do we get those into the hands of the food institute, or to you and I, in January and February? Well, there's a thing called freezing, canning, somehow preserving, which is no mystery to us. So we need to set that infrastructure up in Milton, New York, for those farmers to take those tomatoes off their hands and do something with them. But in the meantime, we have to pay the farmer for those tomatoes, at least a dollar a pound. That's going to be a million dollars to their bottom line. They desperately need it. Now we can get a PO from a food bank, hopefully with some funding, that says we will buy 100,000 quarts of beautiful heirloom tomatoes to put to use in the off season. Then we find a distributor to store them. And now we close that loop. We stop the waste, and we actually purposely put this food to use. And this is the kind of system that needs to be in place. Because that's the system that existed 50, 60, 70 years ago. All of us would stop doing our daily work in the month of September and help harvest. This has been happening in communities forever. Why did we stop doing that? We need to start that up again. Um, so I can talk about this all day, and I tend to, so I'll pass the mic. But I really appreciate you, you being here today. It's such a gorgeous day. Um, but this is something we should be very excited about making very significant change uh, in, this, in this space. So thank you. Can we come back to you? I'd like you to please mention what you're doing at Balboa with, with the excess food, but we also um, uh, are aware of time. I think we started a little late, Lori, so I hope it's OK if we, if we move, uh, move the clock a little bit. Thank you. I'd like to introduce you to uh, Leslie Gordon, the president of Feeding Westchester. Uh, thank you so much. And it's really a delight and honor to share time with both uh, the panelists and our audience this afternoon. Um, Thomas, my intention is not to steal your thunder, but he's actually being a bit humble, so um, I'm sure he can speak about it on his own, but Bauer is responsible for donating hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds of good excess food and connecting it with hungry New Yorkers who reside across the five boroughs of New York City every year through fabulous strategic alliances with City Harvest and I believe the Food Bank for New York City as well. So thank you for all the good work that you do. And that I'm going to pass up the um, And so at, at Feeding Westchester, we're formally called the Food Bank for Westchester. You may have known us uh, through that name up until March of 2018 when we rebranded as Feeding Westchester which at once helps us to more immediately engage in productive conversation about the depth and the breadth of who we are and what we do. We are Westchester County's largest hunger relief organization. At the center of our mission is to ensure that no one in Westchester County, to the extent that we can manage this, goes hungry. And Beth talked a little bit earlier about hunger versus food insecurity. And so to be clear, by definition, hunger is that very physical symptom that you feel when you literally haven't gotten enough to eat. And I know I can be a little bit hangry, not hungry, but you know, if I don't eat by, let's say, you know, 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock most days, you don't want to come and talk to me. It's a little bit hangry. Um, food insecurity is the set of um, 
really social determinants that cause someone to be hungry on a more regular basis and access food, what we call food assistance programs, so food pantries, soup kitchens, shelters, senior centers at all, whether it's here in Westchester County or across the United States, whether it's our neighboring New York City or Connecticut that folks have talked about earlier today. We'll continue to do the good work that we've done for about 30 years now in connecting good, nutritious food to people here in Westchester County. But in more recent vintage, we've begun to take a thoughtful look at how we can tackle hunger from all angles, right? How can we prevent someone from getting online a food assistance program to begin with? Or if they do, how do we take them from what's literally survival to a place of increasing stability and really thriving and achieving what they want for themselves. And so specifically ways that we endeavor to do that include connecting folks with SNAP, formerly called food stamps. So we have someone on our staff who wrote throughout the county free of charge, speaking with seniors and the disabled about their eligibility for this great social benefit, a federal benefit and getting them enrolled in the same. Um, we not only distribute good food at Fitting Westchester, but we also grow food. Um, so we have a full-time on-staff farmer. Um, I call him our master agriculturalist, but internally and lovingly we call him Farmer Doug, Doug Dukandia. Uh, and so we have more than uh, 10, one and a half to two acre farm sites all throughout Westchester County in strategic partnerships with places like the county jail. So we work with prisoners on uh, farming. We work with the Ronald McDonald House, the School for the Deaf in Greenberg, the Westchester Land Trust, a large organization in Yonkers, uh, called, now called Rising Ground, formerly Lincoln Watts. Uh, and so we're growing beans, and we're growing corn, and squash, uh, and medicinal herbs. And it is at once, um, and I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit on the panel, but it's at once therapeutic and also skill building, but of course at the end of the day, nourishing. We're getting good calories, right? Not empty calories as we heard about earlier, but good calories to people who need it. So what's produced on those farms goes to the strategic partners and ends up in their meals, including in the prison system here in the county. And whatever else gets spun off uh, is distributed to our some 300 partners who are part of our network here in Westchester County to get good food to people. Um, increasingly, we're thinking about how do we uh, meaningfully get into things like workforce development, given our expertise in warehousing and distribution. Uh, we have a registered dietitian on staff and also someone with a master's in nutrition who help teach uh, knowledge confidence and skills to folks on low incomes about how do they eat healthy uh, and feed their families. It's an evidence-based curriculum that we teach free of charge throughout the county. And I encourage each of you who have an interest to participate. Frankly, it's one of those things that um, I know that I don't often get a chance to participate in those classes because frankly, I could probably use it. Uh, but we teach them how to look at your supermarket circular that came out that week. Um, and think about with the limited dollars that you have, um, how do you not feel relegated to the inner aisles of the grocery store where product tends to be laden with fat, sugar, and salt, and is a large contributor to diet-related diseases like diabetes, um, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and instead think about how you can use those limited dollars strategically and shop in the produce aisle at all. Um, so we're supposed to tell some stories, right? Um, oh yeah, uh, so Beth likes this, this cool story. So uh, we were talking earlier, Lynn and I, uh, and debating about um, how each of us on this panel potentially got in the business of feeding people and nourishing lives. And is it nature or is it nurture? Um, so in my case, it's a little bit nurture. Um, on the, on the food side, um, I'm very proud and honored um, and speak about this often, but uh, a neighbor to Baldor in the South Bronx is the, the Hunts Point Terminals, the world's largest wholesale produce terminal. Uh, and I'm glad to say a bit of my nurture came through my mother, Myra Gordon, who has run that market uh, for over 30 years. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the other nurture is that every Sunday as a kid, 
I would sled in a car with my mother through great Pecanico Hills and pet the cows on the way when they were there. We'd end up in Tarrytown traveling from Ossining. And uh, my grandfather was an avid member of a synagogue. It still exists in Tarrytown today called Temple Beth Abraham. Um, and so years ago, there weren't food pantries and soup kitchens and shelters like we have today. Um, in fact, many of the, the food pantries and soup kitchens cropped up in the 1980s. The, the first food bank called the St. Mary's Food Bank out of Arizona actually uh, got into business in the 1980s. And then uh, hundreds of organizations, mostly faith-based institutions, in fact, followed suit in the 1980s. But before that, there was a bit of an under, a quiet underground network of support for those who were food insecure in the days of World War I and even World War II. And so in Tarrytown, faith-based institutions, including Temple Beth Abraham, had a confidential list of people in the community who needed help with food. And so my grandfather would grab a name or two off the list, and as my mother tells the story to this day, would take her by the arm and tell her, we're going out. And they would go to a local grocery store, grab a couple bags of groceries, quietly walk up the steps of neighboring apartment buildings, leave the bags, ring the bell, and go. Because what you didn't want to do is shame the recipient. You wanted to make the process as dignified as possible and give them the resources that they needed. And so um, that was an early foray. And then similarly, um, in the days of, of World War II, communities were under-resourced in things like protein, but generally food, and there weren't still food pantries and soup kitchens. And so the back door of the home that I am now the third generation owner of in Tarrytown would act as a sometime soup kitchen. And so folks in the community knew where you could go to get a meal, and you'd ring the bell, the door would open, and you'd come in and sit down and join the family and eat. And so, uh, to this day, I really just feel chills every time I get the pleasure of walking in and out of that back door because um, if I needed to, I would be more than happy to carry on that tradition, but now we've got a more formal system of food banking across the United States um, where food moves to people who need it. I tell people, and, and then I'll move to Linda, that some of what we do at Feeding Westchester is not only good for people, but good for the planet at the same time. And so Beth talked about earlier how food in landfills um, has a deleterious effect on our planet. In fact, it is one of the largest producers of methane gas that has a terrible impact on our environment. Um, when food doesn't have access to oxygen in landfills, it takes years to break down. A head of lettuce could take 10 years, for example, to break down without access to good oxygen in landfills, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Uh, but we'll move millions of pounds, in fact, we're on a trajectory of moving about 10 million pounds of good, nutritious food this year to our neighbors right here in Westchester County, a county, by the way, that's often known first for its level of affluence and not indeed the significant level of need that resides here in the county. It's our seniors on limited incomes, it's our kids, one in three of them who don't have enough food, it's families who work, it's the working poor, who just don't make enough to make ends meet, where the cost of living is far outpacing wage growth, something that we should talk about, right? Because at the end of the day, food insecurity is a poverty problem. Um, it's something that we should talk about. So it's about you know, underemployment, it's about unemployment, it's about building appropriate skill bases. Uh, but we want about 10 million pounds of good nutritious food this year. That is only half of the amount of good food that's actually needed in this county on an annual basis, which amounts to about 20 million pounds or about 17 million meals that go missing from people's plates here in Westchester County every year. But we'll move about, um, I would say, about five or six million pounds at minimum that we'll pick up from the good strategic partners that we have in the county. So Stop and Shop, Shop Right, Acme, Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, BJ's, and the like. Um, we're Johnny on the spot, so our refrigerated trucks will pull up to their docks and take their excess and then move it directly into the hands of people who need it. Similarly, we make trips down to the Hunts Point Produce Terminal almost five days a week. Um, and that's a place where, you know, grocery stores, um, 
small bodegas, independent grocery stores are purchasing on a regular basis in addition to chefs from restaurants, and indeed, they're also spitting off excess. And so we're glad to be a partner with them and pick up millions of pounds of good excess produce and get it into the hands of people. And the stuff is magnificent, right? It's just not potatoes, onions, carrots, and cabbage. Um, we're talking about pineapple, kiwi, artichoke, areco ver, asparagus. And what's interesting about that, we talked about culturally relevant foods earlier. Part of what we're doing at Feeding Westchester is helping to change people's food vocabulary. So we're sharing with them foods that may as yet be unfamiliar to them. And it brings me back to, um, we have a program that distributes free fresh produce regularly in the deepest pockets of poverty here in Westchester County. It's farmer's market style set up. And the first of its kind that we launched like that was in Mount Vernon. And there were a bunch of people standing online, and we had artichoke that day. It was like enormous. People said, what is that? What do I do with that? And so we're doing some education on the ground, handing out good, nutritious recipes. But there's an acculturation process that goes on. So when those same folks came back about two weeks later, they said, well, where's the artichoke? <laughs> right, so there's a lot going on at Feeding Westchester. Um, a plug for us, you can donate, you can advocate, you can volunteer with us. We couldn't do what we do day in and day out without the goodness of nearly 10,000 volunteers who spend their time with us throughout the year. It's a point of efficiency for us, packing food, doing all sorts of things. So if you're interested in getting engaged, don't hesitate to call us or visit us online at feedingwestchester.org. Judith Weber, who lives a very active uh, artist in Nourishell. And uh, I was interested, and am interested, in starting a community garden in the town of Maranek, which is in the process of consideration. They're looking at uh, the comprehensive plan there. So they're legal, for anybody in the audience that's interested in um, the legal process, there is a legal process. And uh, uh, I, I hope I don't embarrass you by saying this, but when I think of you, I think of a giant hug. Uh, I, I went to the uh, community garden and spent hours with Linda, and I'll give you this microphone when I'm done. It you like this. But, it, but in any event, um, uh, it, when we think about community garden, I hope you can talk about you know, your experience setting it up, but uh, when we think about people living in our own homes, uh, on the internet, uh, even people with their private theaters, et cetera, how we have used the word silo. People live in our very um, sort of uh, private worlds. And I think of our farmer markets today, farmer's markets, not only as places that where we can purchase food, but I think of it as the town green here, where I can interact with people and learn what they're doing. Um, Karen Kors in the audience, she's been instrumental in starting our food waste recycling program, and Elizabeth Poyer. And um, we sell uh, kits there, and we end up interacting with people, and we learn from the community. And uh, when I think of community gardens, there's going to be talking about growing food, but I'd also like you to talk about how it's a hub of culture and how we bring people together. Let me introduce Southern to Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so excited to be here. And Beth and I just met, as she said, through Judith Weather. Thank you, Judith, wherever you are. Um, I am the administrator and founder of Grove Lincoln Park. It's a 10,000 square foot organic diet garden located in the center of Nourishelle. And if anybody's been to Nourishelle, you know it's pretty urban. And then on the outskirts, there are residential communities and neighborhoods. Well, we're considered to be right in the middle of the hood which I think is really interesting because I grew up there. Um, actually, I live about two or three blocks away from Lincoln Park. So generally speaking, I walk there, you know, two to three to four times a week. Um, the program started when um, the school district, the city school district of Nourishell decided to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Lincoln School desegregation case. Um, for people who are not familiar with that, that was the first desegregation case filed in a northern city. And Nourishell was dubbed the Little Rock of the North 
which for Nurse Shell, if you guys know anything about Nurse Shell, you know, we're proud of being a community that celebrates arts, diversity, many of the pop, much of the population, especially in the 60s, came from the entertainment and journalistic community. And the reason why they lived in Urshel is because it was close to New York City. Um, so that was a black eye for the community. And a group of parents from Lincoln School took the school district to court um, because they were in violation of the 1954 Supreme Court decision, Brown versus the Board of Education, which made it illegal to have separate schools for black students and white students, that is public schools. So we won, the black parents won, the school district refused to integrate the school and then tore it down and bust the students to schools around the city. So what they did, they made it into a park. And with the 50 year commemoration, I decided to pay homage to those brave parents, faculty members, and students and created an organic park. So I, it, it's a private public partnership with the city. And if anybody has ever, ever worked with municipal government, you know it's kind of tough. <laughs> but for some reason, I was able to make friends. My sister was also, you know, our family has a long history in her show. My sister was the first African-American um, city cook. So her name is Glenberg, everybody knows her. So, you know, that was my entree. Also, when I was a, a senior in high school, I used to work in the city manager's office in New Rochelle, City Hall. And some of those people are still there, which is quite amazing. So I knew the workings of City Hall. So basically, through the Parks and Recreation, um, I was able to convince them that we wanted to put a community garden thing. So the city uh, helped us, the Parks and Recreation, they became our partners, and Bill Zimmerman, who was the commissioner, he helped us. They cleared the land, they put the fence up, and in the last two years, we expanded from 5,000 square feet to 10,000 square feet from 30 grade beds, which the beds are approximately 50 square feet. Um, each bed can feed a family of four through the summer, but because of yields, which is so tremendous, we need to teach them how to actually pan and freeze and do, some of them already do that, especially yeah. in the power grants, right? Yeah. So, you know, we have a lot of incredible farmers. Our farmers are, you know, their backgrounds are from all over the world. We have Serbian farmers, Romanian farmers, Haitian farmers, Mexican farmers. Um, my husband's out here, and my Korean, Korean farmers. And everybody's learning from everybody else because each of these gardeners, or farmers as I like to call them, are growing crops that are indigenous to their homelands. For example, the Korean farmers, they grow bok choy and sesame seeds. The Haitian farmers grow laulu, which is an amazing vegetable similar to collard greens and spinach. Um, so we're having them people who are growing tomatoes, corn, arugula, um, what else? Tomatoes, tons, peppers. You were talking about peppers. Peppers from their, you know, their communities and where they were born. So we're having a great time. It's not just the growing that we're doing. We have a wonderful program where we offer yoga. We also just installed a native plant butterfly garden. And we have an extensive program for young people. We have visits from the school. This year we had about, about 200 kids. We also had a camp this summer for the first time. The city of Mirachel contracted us to do a camp. One of the camps was a special needs camp. And we created a special 
a bed for them, for them to actually prep the bed, you know, fill it with composted soil, um, rake it, prepare it, and then they actually plant the seed. And they were able to come back and see what they grew. So we're trying to teach a whole generation of young people how to become independent, how to eat healthy foods without pesticides, and we teach them about food security. And you know, it's almost like a mantra for them. And we teach them about composting. So this is this is my passion, my husband's passion, and the garden. People are finding out about it, and we have been able to actually increase the support. We just recently got support from Westchester County, and we continue to, you know, to make partnerships with all kinds of government agencies because this is an important issue. And they see that, you know, the, the children and the adults, the parents, because once you engage the, the children, their parents come. And we also have a senior complex that's right next door. They're like our community watch. So if anybody's <laughs> in the garden, unauthorized, because the garden actually has a gate and, and the garden is locked. So each of our gardens has a key. So that makes them feel special also. Um, so we have lots of activities. That was just at our farm to table barbecue, which is an annual event. And the gardeners, you know, create dishes from their crops. And it's a great time for everybody to come together and fellowship. We also have yoga. Um, so we had a sunset yoga and wine tasting event, which was, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> and we had, we had music. Um, so we do a lot of things. Um, and it's a great opportunity to, you know, break down the silos. Yeah. Because the people at our garden are not just from the Lincoln Avenue community. We even have gardeners from Scarsdale. <laughs> and from other places. But one of the big programs that we have is we're teaching our gardens, gardeners that excess food, anything that they're not going to use, we donate to five soup kitchens and food pantries. And so this year was an opportunity for them, the gardeners, to go and take their excess crops individually so that they could actually understand what it means and to meet the people at the food pantries and the soup kitchens. And so that's been extremely successful. Um, how did I get into this? I grew up in a Rochelle and in a Italian neighborhood. And my neighbor, Mr. Judice, he would grow his basil and his tomatoes. And I would go out in the backyard. And I'd say, Mr. Judice, I want to do that. Could you show me how to do that? So he showed me, I wasn't very successful because my uh, plot was under, you know, our backyard is very shady. So eventually, you know, I was growing collard greens, which is absolutely my favorite, and tomatoes. So when the opportunity, and when I came up, up with the idea to do this community garden, I have so many beds now that I just, and plus, it's all sun. We have sunlight for like, 12 hours a day, practically. Um, so we've had abundant crop yield and very little pests. Um, and all of our remedies are, are organic. We use, if we have pests, we use crushed red pepper and vinegar solution and, you know, beer and whatever else we need to <laughs> use to, you know, chase those pests away. So we're doing a lot of exciting things with our garden, and we continue to expand our program. Uh, uh, grocery, uh, Linda's father, I'm sorry, uh, Linda's father had a grocery store 
and people often came in uh, and needed food on credit. Why don't you just speak to that for a minute? Because I think it says very telling, uh, you know, about how people are inspired. Yeah, my father had a grocery store. Actually, it was located right around the corner from where the community garden is. And the name of my father's little grocery store it would have been a bodega today. It was called Mark's Community Store which I think is really interesting that here I am doing the community garden. And when my father opened his community store, he, he used to work, he, he had retired from Arnold Baker's, which was a Baker, Baker, Baker company, bread company in Port Chester. And he retired when he was like 62. And then he said to my mother, I'm gonna buy a store. And we were like, oh my goodness, I was in high school. <laughs> He bought the store on Lincoln Avenue, which was the heart of the black community. There were all kinds of stores on that block, barbershops, beauty parlors, shoe, you know, shoe shine uh, places, and, and pool rooms, and greasy spoons, and a drugstore. And my dad's store was there. So every day, he would just you know, go into that store, which was stocked, everything. Because whenever people came into the store, and they would say, Mr. Mark, do you have such and such? And he'd go, no, baby, but if you come back next week, I'll have it. And he would go down to Bronx Terminal Market, and he would get his vegetables. And I would go down there with him, like at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning. And he would get crates of potatoes, crates of cabbage, crates of greens, crates of onions. And he was, he was a great marketer. He would take those crates and put them out on the sidewalk so that people, when they pass by, that they could, you know, see them. And many of the women in the community were single mothers on welfare. And we were talking about food security and how people at, the, at certain points, you know, during the week, whether it's at the end of the week or at the end of the two-week cycle, when you know, almost getting ready to get paid or once a month when the Women on uh, welfare, they're, you know, they didn't have any more money for food. They would come to my dad's store and they would say, Mr. Mark, I just need some eggs and some milk and some bread and some, you know, lunch meat for my baby. And he would just say, take it, you know, whenever you can, just pay, you know, pay me. And he never kept, you know, the score or he never kept the list of who owed him. And then when my mom, my father died, my mom took over the store, and she did the same thing. So they had this like social agency, you know, just like the kitchen in your house. And I grew up watching that, and I think you know it just becomes part of it. So I think it's nurtured, and I also think it's an environment. for questions. Now, my dad was a family doctor in the Bronx, and my mother was a dietitian. Uh, and, and she ended up, she first was in hospitals, but she also ran uh, lunchroom cafeterias back in the day when you actually cooked um, full meals in the cafeterias. So, uh, you know, that's, that's what brings me to this. I just want to mention that Governor Cuomo uh, is putting food pantries in all the state-run uh, schools. Uh, so that to the extent that students are not able to afford, by the end of uh, 2018, uh, the goal, and I'm, I haven't checked on it, but the goal is to have food pantries. Uh, so I think that's very inspirational. And, and one of the things to think about in schools while we're dealing with what's gonna happen politically with SNAP, uh, to the extent that people are limited if they're not working enough hours or what have you, but we think creatively in our schools about how we can feed our students and I've been researching that, and one very simple example might be, to the extent that you have school lunches and they are unopened, to create a food sharing table. And I haven't made that up, they already exist. But you can put them on a table, or you can have a small refrigerator, and people can just take the food. And that way it doesn't end up in the wastebasket, but it ends up you know, feeding people. Um, one of the things that I think you know, a care very deeply about. We, we talk about mental illness, we talk about drug addiction and destigmatizing these things. I care very deeply about destigmatizing hunger and food insecurity. It can be anybody at any time. 
I think about it, that it could be me when I'm an older adult, if I'm on a fixed income, it could be my neighbor. It, you know, and when you think about the statistics that I mentioned before, it is the people we know. It could be your personal trainer, it could be the person doing your nails, it could be the veterinarian's assistant, absolutely anybody. Um, and so there are things that we can do in our community, whether it's quietly putting things on people's doors, or maybe we even just talk about the fact openly, as we have today, we're saying, you know, so it's nothing to be ashamed of. That we are in an economic status right now in this country where there is a huge disparity of income. And we are trying to find ways in communities where people donate food. And if we, I, I don't know about if normalize is the right way to put this, but if we think about ways that we all need to feed one another, because frankly, selfishly, it's in our economic best interest for everybody to be operating at, you know, at full speed. So I just want to give each of our speakers an opportunity you know, for them to give us a takeaway, uh, and then we'll have an opportunity maybe for a question or two, and then we have a break in between the two uh, programs. Let me just turn this back over. Okay, Ashley, please. Sure. My takeaway actually is, um, and it has always been, my stance has always been, and, and I do love community gardens, especially the Jane Goodall Garden was an urban garden uh, in the city, and it really was the best. There's no pests. It was fantastic. I must say, though, that um, continuing to support your local farmers that are already farming, it is lovely to get a plot and do community gardening, but honestly, your local farmer needs your support to continue doing what they're doing. Um, it's really fun and nice to say that we support our local farmers, but unfortunately farmers markets are actually a really big revenue loss for a lot of farmers because imagine that bunch of kale sitting out all day long that didn't get bought. If they don't have a proper waste stream or place to donate, um, that's going to waste. So I recommend CSAs visiting your local farm so that they can get more business and the bigger they get, then bigger distributors like Baldor can pick them up, thus increasing their revenue stream for the next year. It's just this cycle of supporting people who are already in farming situations. To me, is still very important. We can all do a little garden at home um, and, and with the intent to donate it, I love that, but tangible results of visiting a local farmer, making a personal relationship with that farmer and the people that work on that farm, um, Closer, it's closer than you think. It's a, it's a close, it's, farms aren't just as far away as, as, as you think, they're, they're closer and, and we, need to, we need to do that. And also, um, signing up to be a food running volunteer. Yes? So, to that point, you know how to find CSAs, I think, guys, in this audience, but how do you find a farmer who's not, are you saying that's how we should find our farmers? Find CSAs, CSAs? Most farms that I know, sure, you're saying how do you find a CSA the best? CSA. Right. CSA is the best way for us to find a farm. Really no, I think the best way to find a farm that's near you is to literally just get on Google wherever you live and type in farm. I'm not kidding. Wow. Just type in farm whatever town you're in. Right. And then most farms these days have websites, you know, and you can see the hours. I love a farmer's market that's on the farm. That allows you to visit and see if you like the practices that they're doing. Um, I mean, I know that sounds so rudimentary, but just connecting yourself with one farm that you, and the hours, they're trying to, us farmers are trying to make things more flexible for you, being open on Sundays and Mondays and, and having after hours and after hour pickups for CSAs. And uh, my really good friend, Jess, who runs Holbrook Farm in Bethel has this thing. It's basically like a little card. And instead of a CSA, it's just money on the card. If you purchase the card before the season, you get 50 extra dollars because you're uh, just spending her store because you're helping her buy those seeds and plant those seeds early in the season. She's giving you $50 later on, but she will have that access. That's money, you know, in her pocket and produce in your pocket. And um, we're trying to, you know, trying to, farmers trying to modernize you know, I've seen a lot of good farms lately that realize that it's, they make more money doing weddings and events than they do actually selling produce, and it's killing me. So, um, oh, uh, uh, my farm, my friend makes six to $10,000 every time she has a wedding. People want to look like, and yes, that's not a bad thing, 
But if you're, and then if you use the food, if you insist that the caterer uses the food from that farm, you're creating this beautiful cycle. But unfortunately, it's sad that a lot of farmers have to resort, resort to taking down crops and putting up a little barn with a little arbor for weddings just to make money. So that's that's my takeaway. Okay, there's a hundred things I want to talk about, but I can choose one. Uh, maybe two. So Allie Gorse is here, one of our customers of Valor. Um, I want to tell a quick story of how I got into this, because she asked me before, and um, I want to answer her question. Um, four years ago, I joined Valor. We, one of the things we do at Valor, we take a carrot and turn it into a carrot stick or make a mirepoix. If you buy urban roots at any of your local grocery stores, that's actually processed and uh, produced at Valor. Um, we're processing a million two hundred thousand pounds of produce a week. It generates about one hundred and seventy thousand pounds of leftover food, which we refer to as sparks. Scraps fell backwards with the sea. Sparks uh, really is our way of changing the narrative around, around the way we think about food. And so then we've instructed our team. We're sixteen hundred employees. We're actually the second largest employer. We have the second largest landmass in the in the Bronx, borough of the Bronx, second only to the Yankees. So a very large company with a lot of impact. And so what we've tried to do is get people in our organization to think differently about all of this food under our control. So Sparks would refer to any food product that's in production that we now decide to utilize where maybe in the past we didn't. What am I talking about? We peel a carrot to make a carrot stick. I'm not so quite sure why we peel a carrot. I think a carrot stick can have a peel on it. We could spend a lot of time talking about why that peel is so valuable to you. But suffice to say, we now sell that carrot peel to a few chefs who make carrot cakes and other things with it. Uh, whatever's left over, because I'm not going to uh, sparks, goes to feed animals. So we're feeding ostriches and uh, ducks and pigs and cows and so on. And one of the interesting things is when we first started selling sparks to the farmers, the farmers would respond with, well, we can't feed those vegetables to our animals. And I would sit there and be like, um, why? <laughs> well, our animals get green. Oh. And I'm like, well, I'm not quite sure that's the best thing for your animals, but let's try, let's test. And so we would give the animals some carrot peel, and they would just be like, oh my god, carrot peel is so great. <laughs> so now we're shipping 40 uh, 900 pound bins a week to various farms feeding these animals and hopefully improving their life and their nutrition. Um, Sparks is, has been a journey for Bauer. It's changed our business in such a profound way, and it's allowed our customers to think about us as big distributors. Um, I mentioned Sparks because years ago I attended a conference at Stanford where they launched a refed roadmap for food waste. Refed, anybody know refed? If you don't, good. So I'm part of the refed advisory council, and I attended that meeting, not part of the advisory council. But when I flew to to uh, attend that conference, I landed in San Francisco, and as I forced my wife and kids to always do, we take public transportation to where we're going. So we get. I get it. I, I hadn't been in San Francisco in a while. Um, I, help, I own some, a part of a company in San Francisco, so I said, I'm going to take BART and I'm going to get there. So I put my backpack on, I got on BART, that cost $7.75. I got to Embarcadero, I walked about a mile, I got to the customer, uh, the company. I went in and they were like, Where's your car? <laughs> and I said, No, 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 I just walked here from BART. <laughs> it's like, It's beautiful, I walked along the water, got there. Got a tour, met a lot of the key players, the management team, the one of the shareholders, and they said, where are you heading now? And I said, Palo Alto, I'm going to Stanford for a conference. And they said, well, drive here. I said, no, 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 I'll be fine, I'll get there. But how did you get there? Well, like Caltrain. Why did you get to Caltrain? I'm gonna walk to the trolley, I'm gonna take the trolley to Caltrain. I, I, I must look like an alien. Anyway, they did that. I got on Caltrain, and what you may know, going from San Francisco to Palo Alto is, you sit in Caltrain and watch everybody sit in traffic while you get to go to Palo Alto, <laughs> which is hard for me to believe the train was really empty. Anyway, I got out there and I, I was, of course, um, I was jet lagged, went to bed early, got up about 3 o'clock in the morning, went to the gym, didn't turn the lights on, working out. And this gentleman walks in and he says, Excuse me, do you mind if I turn the lights on? I'm like, Well, if you need to, sure. So he turns the lights on, he gets on a machine next to me. What are you doing here? And I'm like, Well, I'm going to this conference. Tomorrow. He's like, is it refed by chance? I'm like, yeah, refed. He's like, well, I'm actually, I funded refed. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. So I tell him a little bit about what I'm thinking about doing at Palador. And he's like, I need you to say a few words. I'll make this very quick now. 
The conference goes on the next day, and Grief has done an amazing job, and it's hard for me to criticize Jesse Fink and that whole team, because I just adore all of them, but they deserve some criticism. They offered, of all the people speaking, top folks from big companies saying, in 2030, we're gonna do this, and in 2050, we're gonna have impact. I'm thinking, 2050, I can tell you where I'm gonna be in 2050, it's not gonna be working. So I was called upon by this gentleman to speak at the end of the conference. It's 4.30 in the afternoon, everybody's exhausted, and this gentleman's wrapping up the conference. He said, is this guy Thomas in the audience? Can you come up to the dais? And I said, no, 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 I'm in the back here. They have mics. I'll speak from back here. Everybody has to turn around. And I said, sustainability is uncomfortable. We need to get uncomfortable here. 2030, that's a shame. We're talking about a roadmap that somebody invested in, and we're gonna sit here and accept that in 2030 we're gonna make change? We're just kicking the can. Baldor Specialty Foods will be a zero gas to landfill company in 2016 from our fresh cuts operation. But everybody claps when people stood, get on the airplane, I land, my cell phone's blown up, it's the president of Baldor. What did you say in California? <laughs> How are you gonna do that? Well, I made it, that was April, and uh, on November 10th, 2016, we became a zero gas to landfill company. So what I'm here to inspire you to think about is that we can do this. This is not about what everybody else does in the panel, it's what I do, it's what you do. Take your company down this journey. There are so, and your home, there are so many opportunities for us to have huge impacts in this space. And we need to put the excuses aside and make very serious change happen today. Thank you. So that's a tough act to follow. Um, so that's a tough act to follow. Um, I'll be quick. So vote, right? You have the power of the vote. Um, vote, advocate, talk to your legislators about uh, encouraging um, large-scale waste generators to donate their access to your supermarkets, even if you don't live here in Westchester County, because many of you may not. Um, volunteer. Right? Your skills, your time are valuable to other organizations, provide your insights. And post-consumer waste is one of the largest contributors to food waste and landfills and the generation of methane gas. You can replicate <clears throat> what Thomas talked about in their Sparks program right in your own home kitchen. Think about all the marvelous things you could do. And we've all largely forgotten because we've gotten super busy in our lives about what our grandparents used to do and their parents used to do. I mean, think about where Booyah Base came from, right? It's because you had that head of the fish and all these other parts, and yet now everybody loves an order of Booyah Base on the menu. But it, it, it's a point of origination was, what am I gonna do with all these parts and pieces that are you know, extra and left over from what I'm cooking in the kitchen? So I encourage you to start to think about, you know, make soups with your soup stock, with your chicken carcass. Don't throw it into the garbage and let it end up in a landfill. There's so much that you can do uh, to prevent waste from ending up in a landfill. My takeaway is to continue to educate children. Um, the thing that we do at Grove Lincoln Park is we're teaching the kids how to grow their own food. Once they learn how to do this, they can do anything. They can take care of themselves. Their uh, health will improve because they'll be ex they're being exposed to organic, healthy vegetables that they're selecting to grow themselves. Um, so the hands-on experience is invaluable. And that just, that current of knowledge will spread for generations. And that's what we're doing today. I have put together this handout. You can take a look uh, at it. And again, it will be available digitally. But it has links to places where you can uh, find recipes. This is, um, this is an example of a book by Dan Gunders. Uh, who's a food expert. And uh, there are a number of other pieces of information here that can help you to conserve what you consume, 
and uh, you know, minimize the waste that you uh, produce from your home and put it more toward nourishment. I want to thank you all. I want to thank my panelists. I hope you enjoyed this, and we can follow up with more questions when we're done. So this is, uh, our, this is our second annual creative writing sponsored, MFA creative writing sponsored food justice conference. We started this last year because one of my students in the graduate creative writing program is a very passionate advocate of uh, sustainable food uh, and food justice issues. Um, and I'm always looking for ways to use writing and communication for social causes, uh, social justice causes, and this seemed to be a really excellent fit. I had a student who was highly motivated and I could imagine ways in which the, the writing could fit with the activism. Um, in our first Food Justice Conference last year, we had a writing workshop and we're trying a little bit different this year. We're going to have a, um, a food justice dinner um, where we'll have a storytelling event on, on the topic of hunger. Um, our two panels today were organized by my student, Lori Fontanis, and Beth Radow, who's an attorney and a local food justice activist. Um, they, they brought so much uh, power and energy to discussions about hunger in the region and sustainable food and food waste. Um, the evening portion will be a little bit of fun with um, a meal uh, from locally sourced foods and some storytelling. Uh, and it's all in the effort to do something positive with our creative arts. So combining creative writing and social justice is part of what we try to do at Manhattanville. So Manhattanville College historically has a mission of social justice. It's not um, something that the college does as sort of a, an overt we're always thinking about social justice, it's who we are, but it's more under the under everything we do here is this flow of social justice and what can we do with our education and our skills and our creativity to support social justice issues. Um, so a creative writing program, often people want to write about their personal lives and things that they've experienced in life, but now and then you have to take on a social cause um, and food justice is a really great one. Um, there's no reason why 20% of the people in Westchester County are, are hungry. Um, we partnered this year with the Education um, Sustainability Program. It's the Sustainability in Education Program. Um, just thinking that that's another way to broaden our reach um, and to make partners so that together we can be more effective. The more of us work together on these causes, the more um, tools we'll have to actually make a difference and create some kind of change rather than just talking about change. So hopefully some of my students are motivated to tell stories about hunger and fighting hunger, to write stories about those things. Hopefully we inspire some people to get involved in the sustainability and education program. Um, hopefully we inspire a lot of people to take these ideas into their lives. I'm here today at the Food Justice Conference for two reasons. One, I'm uh, work at, obviously I work at Manhattanville College, and Lori Soderdalen and I um, started talking this summer about our shared um, concern for and our shared passion for food justice, for social justice, for ecological justice. So I would put it all under the umbrella of socio-ecological justice. And we both um, have programs and desires to create people or provide education for change agency. It's also true that Beth Radow, who's one of the panelist moderators um, for today, is teaches in the program that I designed here at Manhattanville College. So Beth and I are the two instructors for a five course program in education for sustainability. And that, does, that course, is that program is do, designed for educators from across the spectrum. So anybody that wants to be an educator for a sustainable future, whether or not you're working in corporate social responsibility, working in not-for-profits, working in nature centers, working in schools, you can come to Manhattanville College and get an advanced certificate in education for sustainability and learn how to be a change maker. So one of the reasons why I got involved in this is my first academic appointment after my PhD was at the University of Melbourne where I became the director or actually a deputy director in their 
in Master of Environment program or their graduate environment program. And then when I left Melbourne and came to Manhattanville, our dean told me about a partnership they have with a not-for-profit called the Children's Environmental Literacy Foundation. And every summer we co-host an Education for Sustainability Summer Institute. And when my dean learned about my expertise in sustainability, she said, we should design a program here at Manhattanville. And so I did do that. I designed the program. And we now have uh, the sixth cohort is starting, has started this fall. And so we've had five cohorts of students graduate. And those students, as you met um, Amanda earlier, um, those students are doing remarkable work in public schools, in higher education, um, in um, corporations. Uh, one student was in, in the fashion industry and is a professor at LIM in, Man in Manhattan um, and has done extraordinary work in um, reforming uh, fashion practices to be more sustainable. So we're a, a, a program that reaches a broad variety of people. We're one, um, I don't, I think there at the most, there are four programs like this across the country and we're the only one in the region. So that's, and we're very proud of what we're doing. I have a very special place in my heart for Lori Fontanas who humbly describes herself in her six word memoir uh, as writer, backyard farmer, and community advocate. Uh, Lori has devoted much of her consider considerable energy to taking on environmental causes. She's an MFA student here at Manhattanville, a uh, creative writing student, uh, which means I've had the pleasure of coming to know her artistic abilities, even as I've learned from her writing about many of the issues that she's passionate about, which include healthy, sustainable food production, feeding this big, hungry planet, the politics of food production, and raising ducks. That last one is kind of there to make you laugh, but <laughs> she does raise ducks, so I should tell you about it. Lori's activism in food justice was what brought about uh, this collaborative conference, actually. Uh, it's not always an obvious fit for a creative writing program, a sponsored event that brings together community organizers, farmers, chefs, and the like. But Lori made this thing seem like a good idea for which I am really grateful. And I thank her for all the effort she's put into this, along with Beth, to, to make these panels come together. Um, and so without any further words from me, let me introduce you to Lori, who will introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you, Lori. And yes, I know that everybody is Lori here in the MFA program. So if you sign up, you have to change your name. Um, so we're going to run our um, little panel here a bit differently than the first panel. Um, I'm of a journalist uh, background as well, and so what I was telling my, um, my team here is that we're gonna have a little more conversation, a little more back and forth, I'm gonna ask some questions, not too tough, I hope, but more to give to elicit a little bit uh, more from them, especially since the first um, panel did cover a bunch of stuff already on food waste, so we we'll wanna see if we can move it to the next step, sort of imagine what some new ideas might be. So um, I'm going to make a few sort of opening remarks to, uh, to set the, the stage here about how I see that. Then I'm going to introduce the panelists. Then we're going to ask some questions. But if you have specific questions while we're talking that are really just very pertinent to what we're talking about, just go ahead and raise your hand. Because I know that a lot of you guys in the audience also um, are very passionate about this and very knowledgeable. So definitely no problem um, doing that. We can get you guys in that too. So, food waste doesn't start at home. I know that's kind of shocking, um, if, especially if you, you know, came here thinking that we were just going to be talking about composting uh, and that sort of thing. It's, uh, you can talk about composting and that sort of thing, I don't have a problem with that, but I, I also wanted to let you know that, um, that these things that we're going to talk about are about the food system, the food before it gets to your refrigerator, okay? And that is because I believe the average citizen gets left holding the bag for a lot of this stuff. I mean, seriously, don't you feel guilty when you leave the lettuce in the refrigerator? Or if you guys have ever seen the strawberry? I mean, anybody ever feel guilty with raising hands? Right, okay. 
I think we can stop with that a little bit, okay? <laughs> because it really isn't just our fault. And I think that sh having some shame about it is probably good if it motivates behavior, but I'm worried that it, you know, every time we bring up things that are shameful, we don't want to look at it as closely as we could. So that's part of it. The truth is, is that many structural decisions have been made even before that sad pint of strawberries gets to the back of the refrigerator and gets all moldy and then goes in the trash. Um, is that mean we shouldn't worry about the strawberries? Of course, no, we, we need to worry about the strawberries and take personal responsibility, but you know, we shouldn't be wasting food, we shouldn't be giving it away. All of those things that the first panel talked about. But the food waste problem is not just about uneaten food in our homes, our schools, and restaurants. It's also a problem of what we grow, how we grow it. It's about unnecessary waste on the farm, food loss all along the distribution network. It's about mega portions, right? I mean, think about it. Like, anybody as old as I am remembers the time when McDonald's hamburgers were all this little, right? And somewhere along the line, growing all these commodity crops in a cheaper way, Restaurants started just putting more stuff out on their plate, whether we needed it or not, because this is the way the, the marketplace works. It's not necessarily the best thing for us or the best thing for the planet. So we should be talking about that as well. There's also a problem of superabundance of choice, right? We've been told by the system that, and I, and I actually talked to Leslie about this at the break, We've been trained to think that when we walk into a supermarket that the shelves must be completely packed. You should be able to have a choice of, you know, what is it, 75 different cereals? 75 different kinds of Oreos, right? Is that a good thing or not? I mean, in my opinion, it's not. There's repercussions for that. And it hasn't always been like that. In my lifetime, we used to only have one kind of Oreos. I know that's shocking. But all of this leads to this problem of food waste. The other piece, and I think that we're going to talk about this in terms of schools too, the, the terrible quality, and of course we're in Manhattanville, so we're in a school, the terrible quality of institutional food, right? When I went here, when I went here, they had good food, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, no, no, no I'm sorry. Yeah, I, actually, I didn't mean just to make a comment on Manhattanville, but school food in general. Um, but you're right. Or airplane food. Right? How much food is wasted? It's so bad. Nobody's eating it. It's just distributed whether everybody wants not it or anymore. not. Right? No, not anymore. <laughs> well, yes, that's true. That is true. But it's made. It's prepared for those flights just in case someone's going to buy it. Right? So there's all these elements of the system where it's built in just in case we need it and want it rather than we actually need it and we actually want it. So that's my sort of global look at the whole food waste thing. We're not going to cover every aspect of that at all. We're mostly going to be focusing today on what you can do as a resident, as a citizen, as a, as a member of a church, or you know, if your kids go to school um, and you're dealing with the, the terrible state of uh, a lot of school lunches and things like that. But um, I do want to sort of step back first at, at the very beginning and, and have us think a little bit about what food waste means in general. So with that in mind, we're going to shift now to introduce our panel. Um, I had this grand vision that we were going to do this thing like, like from the state level, and then we'd go down to the county level, and then the municipal level, and the thing, the, the cards are all, we, we screwed that all. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. Ron needs to use the laptop, so we, we moved it around. So instead, let's have that vision in mind. We're actually going to start at sort of the municipal level, if we could think of it that way. Ron Schulhoff, who's to my right here at the end, is a Scarsdale resident and chair of the Scarsdale Conservation Advisory Council, which in partnership with the village of Scarsdale, launched the first municipal food scrap recycling program in Westchester County in 2017. The program started as a drop-off site where residents could bring food scraps from home. This service became so popular that this year, Scarsdale also launched residential curbside pickup of food scraps. Since the program began, over a thousand homes in Scarsdale have participated and over 300,000 pounds of food waste have been recycled into compost. Ten other municipalities in the county have also launched similar recycling programs. 
Working as volunteers running his partner in sustainability initiatives, Michelle Stoeckling, have also helped school districts, houses of worship, and other organizations to launch zero waste and food scrap recycling programs. Please welcome Ron Schroll. Oh. Also to my right, Braden K. Cohen is Operations Manager for Sustainable uh, Materials Management Incorporated. This is Westchester County, now we're on the county level, um, Westchester County's first New York State DEC registered food scraps composting facility. Yay, no, that is a yeah, definitely. Braden is an Edgemont, New York native and graduated from Ithaca College with a degree in environmental science. He found his calling in the world of composting after many seasons working on organic farms in the Finger Lakes and Hudson Valley regions. Braden has also worked at Cayuga Compost, a commercial composting facility in Trumansburg, New York, has been a sustainability educator at the Greenberg Nature Center, and worked for the New York uh, City Compost Project, hosted by the New York Botanical Gardens, where he helped establish a network of community-oriented food scrap, drop-off sites, and processing centers. He met Anthony Carbone, now president of Sustainable Materials Management at the two, 2014, I'm going to get this wrong, NYS, did you say it by the initials? Or did you say it? NYSAR. NYSAR, NYSAR, NYSAR. Or again, this is like a food waste thing, guys, no, it doesn't. Um, organic Summit, and learned they shared a vision of establishing a composting facility in Westchester. Please welcome Brittany Cohen. <laughs> now to my left. Moving to the sort of the school level, um, Amanda Saki has been an environmental educator for over 20 years. She began her career as a non-point source, is that non-point pollution? Yeah. Yeah, non-point pollution source and groundwater specialist at the Virgin Islands Division of Environmental Protection. And then moved on to teaching middle and high school science at the Good Hope School in St. Croix, St. Croix, right? U.S. Virgin Islands, I was gonna do French then. St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. There she ran the school's annual Intel Affiliated Science Fair and showcased student research in St. Croix's annual Agricultural and Food Fair. In 2013, Amanda moved to Rye, New York, my town, and since then has been teaching middle school science at Rye Country Day School. Amanda holds a BA with a double major in geology and dance from Hamilton College. Currently, she's working on her master's in biology at right here at Manhattanville College, where she also obtained, yay, and an advanced cert uh, certificate in education for sustainability. Please welcome Amanda Sackler. <laughs> All right, and last but certainly not least, on the, on the state level, we have Gary Feinland, who has the longest uh, affiliation name in, uh, in this list, is an environmental program specialist for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's Bureau of Waste Reduction and Recycling. <laughs> and no, I can't say that five times real fast. Gary has worked for um, New York State DEC for 20 years, most of that time with the Bureau of Waste Reduction and Recycling. Lately, he has focused on reducing wasted food, food donation, and the recycling of food scraps, along with his peers in the organic production and recycling section. Gary is the chair of the New York State Food Recovery Campaign, sponsored by the New York State Association of Reduction, Reuse, and Recycling, or all, or? ISAR. ISAR, right. <laughs> Gary holds a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from the Rutgers School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, and a master's degree in environmental science from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Please welcome Gary Feinman. <laughs> There's two parts that are big, food and waste. So I thought what we do is look at it sort of again, like this journalistic eye, and look at sort of like when you write an opening lead, the what, the why, and the where of food waste. Because I want to make sure, like I did in my opening, that you understand that it's everywhere, right? It's all along the so-called food chain. So I'm going to ask each of you to give me your take from your per personal sort of experience of this, telling tell, telling us something we don't know yeah. about food waste. 
the what, the why, and where. It could be something we never said, but tell me your take on what, 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 where is this food waste coming from? Let's start with Ron. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. I think um, in talking to so many people at schools and houses of worship, you know, residential, that often people don't even realize they have food waste. I think often you talk to people and say, oh, do you have a lot of food waste? And the view is, and not really. No, I eat everything, or I don't have anything. And one of the beauties of these programs, even though it focuses on the end piece, recycling the food, completely agree, we want to not have that food waste. We don't want people to buy extra food. We want people to eat their food. But this helps build some awareness, and it's something that's very interesting how many people come back and say, boy, I did not realize just how much food I waste every week even though I thought I was being conscientious about it. And so that's something that I learned. That's that's good. Great. Um, I've had a lot of interactions with food waste. And um, I, you know, from working at restaurants, from working on farms, from running management complex facilities, and so much of it is still edible. Um, it's, you know, I used I used to think myself sometimes, you know, working at Cave of Compost, you know, we'd get a, a load from Wegmans and there'd be great broccoli and great, you know, oranges and everything was still good. So, you know, just wash it off, make sure it's clean. Um, and it was great. But, you know, uh, it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous, and um, there's so much to do before it gets to a compost facility that, that can be done. So. Great story. Do you guys want to use that under <coughs> Lori, I'm glad you pointed out that it's not a personal thing. You shouldn't feel guilty, but that's you know, the first thing that comes to mind is you know, growing up when my father, my, my father was a Rastafarian, so it was, everything was, he grew things, and I, I think I picked up that lifestyle. And living on an island where I, by geographic, maybe luck, but also disadvantage, um, we had to import a lot of, or we still rely on heavily on imports, and, and also rain. And so I think that food waste comes from being in a geographically lucky place where excess and abundance is you know, in your favor. And so by default, you're not really thinking about you know, turning off your water as you take a shower, you know, shower in between soaping up or maybe the leftover food that you, know, you don't see as being useful because you know, you're gonna have more. Um, the following day, and so I think complacency and just not, you know, like lack of awareness. I, you know, like I think personally of, you know, my father, like he just was very, very strict about um, not wasting, and he grew up in a home where there wasn't, you know, a lot of excess, and so I just through our family values, you know, I, my guilt of maybe not liking the eggplant that wasn't cooked there really enough, I like spit into my napkin and hide it under the table. That's what I think about when I think about food waste. But you know, as you know, as an you know, as I am educated more and more about it, it's a space, you know, it's industrialized, you know, subsidies, um, you know, government subsidies that put small farmers out of business. They can't compete and you know, the misconception of using fossil fuels to bring in, you know, I don't know, like avocados and you know, blueberries from Peru, like just this just misconception, it's this bubble, inflated bubble that we're paying the cost and unless it's immediate, um, I think we don't respond as quickly. So, complacency. <laughs> And I think there's a cultural component too. So uh, I garden and I love to grow kale. Any kale growers out there? Oh good, a bunch. Any kale eaters? A lot more. So, and I will peel my kale off of the stems and make whatever I'm making. Uh, let's say it's a kale salad. And I used to just throw the stems in my compost bin. And um, nowadays, when I can, I chop up those stems into little pieces and I freeze them. And then I use it for some sort of stir fry. I'm still trying to, or a saute, uh, figure out how I can use it best. And, I, and the book that was talked about, the last panel, I think will be helpful there. 
um, from Dana Gunders. But I, I think that's a big part of it. We, this idea of root to tip cooking is something that many of us don't do. And, and the restaurant industry also is guilty of this, although I think they use a lot more of the food than we do. I think all of us could be, used, could be converting this wasted food that we often think, oh, it's, it's compostable, so it's OK. But no, let's eat it. Yeah. Because uh, somebody said in the earlier panel that it takes 10 years for a lettuce to to decay, right? It's so, not in a right, yeah. Right. Not, 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 not a compost. No, 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 not a right. So if you're just, if you're just, so even things that are organic take forever to break down in the wrong, under the wrong conditions. But you know what you just said that reminded me of something too is what we were talking about is how many people here cook? I mean, actually cook. That's great. <laughs> I'm really thrilled with that. And do you guys cook from scratch? Like if we gave you a right. See, we're preaching to the choir. We really need to go out on public table. Um, because it, none of this really works well if you if you if you're not cooking, right? I mean, if you're just reheating something in a microwave, it's a different it's a different sort of problem. So um, so I think we have a better understanding about what food waste actually is, and sort of a little bit about where it comes from and so forth. So really. We've got that part figured out. Now we just need to know what can we do about it, right? So to me, I think it's two different pieces. One is action, and one is probably advocacy. You put them in two categories like this. But let's go a little bit deeper into exactly what you guys are doing so you understand what our wonderful panel of experts is actually doing with this very difficult, very fraught, very large problem. Um, so we're gonna take it from a different direction. This I'm gonna start with Amanda. And she's like, whoa, no. Um, just keep you guys on your toes. So in terms of the school picture, so I, I actually, I wrote a story about this a couple of years ago. There was this astonishing um, statistic from the LA Unified School District, which is a very large school district. We lived in California for a while. And they had something, they were throwing out like 100,000 pounds of food every day. Throwing it out, 100,000 pounds were going to waste. Now this is during the Obama administration when they had mandated that there were more fruits and vegetables. I, I don't know what percentage that was. I don't know how much of it was food waste in that format, like just a whole apple or what have you. But um, I know that Rock Country Day School is doing amazing things in terms of sustainability. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, what you see now and, and have you seen change over a certain amount of time? But give us some idea of what the picture is in schools. Yeah, I'm definitely standing on their shoulders for sure. Um, they, and it's been, you know, we talked about briefly that it, you know, some of this change has happened, you know, gradually. And then, you know, I was thinking just about like the whole plastic straws revolution that happened in a year or a couple of months. Um, and, you know, it, it depends. Like, you know, it depends on the education that you're doing and getting everyone on board. And I do, as an educator, feel that like that's to me like where I start. Um, and I, I feel like I'm in a really advantageous position because I, I have. I'm lucky to be able to design a curriculum around you know, like my hidden agendas, you know, human, you know, equal rights and food waste and conservation and food empowerment. And so I do, I have, as a part of my curriculum, um, I have a classroom garden. And I think that, and you do, you reach students and then you reach families through your classrooms um, where students are, you know, growing their own food. I mean, it's so, it's so awkward that we're so detached, many, not everyone, but, Detached from like the basic, you know, seeds and the ground. People love it, you know, and I. But growing your own food and having students see where kale comes from and you know, pulling a carrot and seeing the abnormal figures—it's it's really fun. And kids are more open, definitely more open to eating food. So like their awareness of where food's coming from, and also just being able to you know, taste fresh food, and just like there's that deeper connection that's made. So I, I see that as an opportunity as a teacher to use my garden curriculum to educate and spread awareness um, of food waste. But I, you know, coming into Rye Country Day, there's been a lot that's been done, um, and I have like a whole long list to give you. I, don't, I won't give you all the details, but... Oh, you, well, do you, do you ever eat in the lunchroom? I do. I, I also I wanted to mention the whole lunchroom thing. I think it's definitely um, tied to, anyway, economically. I spent the first seven years of my life in public school, and the most of, um, in the Virgin Islands, and most of what we 
aid was like through a public school food program. There was very little, like actually very few fresh fruits. It was odd because we were eating like mandarins where we could have been eating, you know, a coba bananas. It was just, but it's saying again, like when you're talking about an industrialized system, like if there are people who have contracts to feed you processed foods, they're going to the ones in charge of your nutrition. And I just remember, I remember hating sweet peas. A canned peas. I had, I couldn't eat the food, and I rarely did. You know, my father was a farmer, and so I, you know, passed on like the the, the veggies on our plate. But you know, going to Red Country Day, it's a whole different. And it's you know, we are at an economic advantageous. We're in an economic advantageous position, which is this very similar to Manhattanville. And I know that there are different levels of quality of foods, but um, if you, you know, if you're not in the system, you know, if you're not in this, you know, social or economically um, advantageous position, you're not going to have that access. And so, yes, like, so there's that. Rye Country Day has an amazing, so I, I feel really privileged. I mean, it's a very privileged position to speak on behalf of, you know, like the resources that we have that are able to, we're able to um, have a private contractor who comes in, like, and they, they are, the, who they are in charge. Take away the, uh, the access. Yes, they take away the So we have a zero waste. So we do the zero waste um, program. So that's like, I mean, that's a big thing. And you know, and looking back at the history, it started off with you know smaller trays, um, and there we encourage students to not use trays, so we save water. Um, and of course, you know, like there's, you know, middle schools are a little awkward. Yeah, a little awkward. <laughs> so then trays still, you know, serve a purpose. But um, we it was a process, you know, using signage and then just no one committing to it. So we don't like we don't waste food. What it does, I mean, there is there is waste. Um, students do throw away things and. You know, teachers, science teachers in particular, but also other, you know, teachers who are eating with students will ask, you know, well, why don't you like think about how much food you want on this plate? Right. And when I'm covering, like when we're you know going going over um, carbon footprints, you know, I talk about you know size and portions and where that's going. So I take advantage of using um, their observing their feeding habits to make you know lessons up. But yeah, it's a zero waste cafeteria. Um, we have a compost um, a hauler that comes in. And we've like transformed all of our whatever our disposable items are, whether they're the cutlery or the plates and um, you know plates and napkins are all biodegradable. So that's like it's been this huge thing for us. Um, that I'm really proud of. Right. It's and it's really clear. I mean, because we do know. I know there's a couple other Rye residents in the audience, and so the lunchroom thing, even in an affluent area. Um, the food isn't always great. And right. But that's the contract, right? Right, it's part of it. Is there anybody else here at the table who's dealt with the schools in terms of like hauling the food waste or repurposing the food waste, using it some other way? We use clear bins too, so there are days that we want to point oh, out to the students how much food they throw away. Yeah, so they can see visually oh, how much food gosh. they throw away. And like, you know, like where does that energy now go to? Even though it is, you know, it, it is composted. But making like a visual out of it. And signage is really important. Yeah, definitely. Ron, are you working with schools too? Yeah. If you don't mind, I'm just throw a picture up there because I think what you're talking about the signage is really important in the setup. I brought a few pictures, visual stuff. So in the, but then actually, as I bring up pictures, I'll talk. The municipal program in Scarsdale really started in the schools. So Michelle and I started this program five years ago in the schools because it's the kids that that can really make it an immediate change and don't have a muscle memory thrown out. So this is what the lunchroom used to look like. Probably a lot of this looks familiar to a lot of people. And this is what the lunchroom looks like now. And I think what's important to see is you have signage at eye level. You have signage of what the kids are using. So if you look at the compost bin, those green utensils, just like at Rye Country Day, in Scarsdale, they're all compostable. The plates are made out of wheat straw or sugar cane leaves. The bags are made out of corn, and all food can go in there because a commercial hauler, like Braden, picks it up, so it's different. Well, process, not you guys, processor. But a, a processor can process everything. So it's not like your backyard bin where you can only do fruits and vegetables. And the other piece is we brought all the bins together, and we put lids on them and color-coded everything. And the takeaway from this for us in Scarsdale was that we had to make it really, really easy for the kids. You know, this is, we're asking them to do something very different. In the high school and the middle school, they've been doing this, we've all been doing this, everything that trashed a certain way with muscle memory for a long time. 
And so when we ask somebody to do it a little differently, let's make it really easy for them. So this is what right. our school looks like now. So and they can use everything. It's not just it's not just like food um, unprocessed food. It's everything that the lunchroom produces that you can put into the compost. Yes. Right. And did you have to? Did you know? Do they have to change the any of the menus in order to accommodate them? So um, what we had to change was moving to compostable products. So what we didn't want to do was ask students to have a plastic utensil and something that would go in the trash, and something would go in the recycling, and they have to sort of stand there and sort. So we switched everything to what we call the one dump method. So everything on your tray is compostable. All the food, all the products. Separately from all of this, we are trying to improve the food in the Scarsdale School District. We are a public school district. Um, this year, the district hired a district chef and a dietitian. And before we were sort of just bringing in what you would traditionally think of as school food, and now they're cooking a lot more from scratch. And they're trying to be aware of you know, what are the kids eating, what are the kids not eating. Um, so we can not serve them things they don't want, or that none of them are gonna eat, or that are not nutritious. Ron, can I ask you about cost on compostable and what that does on the bottom line? Would sure. You? So, depends where you're coming from, will impact the cost. If you're coming from styrofoam, it will be more. Styrofoam, cost-wise, is just going to be the cheapest no matter what. If you're coming from other products, it varies. So just to show you, I'm not sure if you can see the sign, but the trays, the boats, the napkins, and the plates that we were buying were already compostable. In fact, a lot of things that we all buy are already compostable. A China plate we all buy from Costco. That's a compostable plate. So some of the things were more. Um, in Scarsdale, our food service is self-funded. So it's done by people buying the food service. So there wasn't an impact to the district budget. It was just to the um, people buying. The important, the reason I say that is that all of that, let's say, adds seven cents to a meal. For an individual, it's not a big impact. Um, if you add it all for a district, it could be, but this was all to um, I had a question about the state level. And there you go. Just, well, I was just going to uh, talk about something that Ron was chatting about, which is um, getting healthy foods from like local farms into schools. And as far as I was looking at that, and the New York State Department of Agriculture in Markets has a farm to school program where they fund coordinators who work with the schools to get more local foods to the schools. And um, so that's, that's a really good program to look into to see if your school could qualify and how you could obtain funding for that. Um, regarding some of the work that I've done on the state level, I'm part of a food recovery campaign through NISAR that we've mentioned a couple times now. And we have done a survey with the help of the health, the, not the health department, the schools, to look across the state at what, from the food service directors, what they're doing in their schools in terms of diverting food through either sharing tables, as was mentioned at the other panel, or through food donation. And we found that about 40% of the schools, uh, so we, the survey went to about 1,000 folks, and we got back 225 surveys. And of those 225, 40% of them had share tables, which is fantastic, a place where you could put your unused milk or your thick skin fruits or your wrapped uh, whatever that you received from the school lunch program so that other students could eat it. And some of those schools also have backpack programs so that if it doesn't get eaten by students during that lunch period, some of the food that's at least shelf stable can go home with hungry kids. And um, the donation piece is harder. It's harder because uh, schools are unsure about what the liability issues are and the health department has certain regulations. So about 10% of the schools that we heard back from were doing that. We're, uh, donating food to local pantries or whatever. 
or, or they had a program within the school, an after-school program that the, some of that excess food could go to. That's great. The, the anticipated part of my question, too. I was wondering, does the state have any support mechanism, either in funding or, or elsewise, help schools start such a program? Like, That's a great question. And I don't know of any funding from DEC doesn't, well, take that back. So we have funding for school districts. Right. Our funding is for municipalities. And in the under the categories of what a municipality is, towns, villages, counties, as you might expect, it also includes school districts. So they could apply for up to 50% reimbursement for doing recycling, composting, or uh, waste reduction kind of stuff. So that's great, because really, just having one school is, is great, but having a whole district, it amplifies the Absolutely. Episode. Absolutely. So, um, Brayden, yeah. Um, so, on the receiving end of all of this, um, it is extremely important to have people like Ron and Amanda who are in their school or are educating uh, in their communities because um, contamination, non-compostables, winding up in with organic waste. Um, if, you know, Unfortunately, it's a fact of life and facilities need to deal with it, but when it's at too high of a level, it winds up in a landfill or in Westchester at the burn plant. So um, the science and the programs and the teachers who are involved in the schools, helping the kids, helping the communities are imperative. You know? uh, because without it, you won't have a clean stream and it won't make it to the compost facility. So actually, let's pivot now to this whole notion of the residential user and so forth. And I have heard through the grapevine that there has been some hiccups with some of these rollouts because of this problem of contamination and the, the difficulty in convincing people that plastics are, um, are not a problem. Um, can you speak to how, you know, how difficult is it? Can you give us any specific examples um, and advice? to other, because we're, I know there are a lot of sustainability people out here. What, what can, what, how can we avoid some of these issues? Um, outside, of schools. outside of schools. Um, outside of schools, it takes, you know, where waste is generated, you know, restaurants, supermarkets, um, anything, any place where organics are sold, uh, packaging, really, you know, the stuff that we get as contamination is wrappers, it's bags, it's, um, you know, the clamshells that aren't compostable, you know, it's the rubber bands that hold your, you know, spoiled bunch of lettuce that you didn't eat that week. Um, so it takes a concerted effort from various industries to shift towards producing packaging that is readily uh, available to be composted. So it's easier to change the packaging than to change people's minds? I would think so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Easier to change packaging than to change people's wow. behavior. Well, part yeah. of the problem, and I'm talking about plastics and not food, is New York City passed the plastic bag bill, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not referring to you, Gary, but New York State overturned it. So we could have recycled all these plastic bags in the city and uh, up in Albany, they decided that wasn't a good idea. I think they're coming forth now with their own thing. I don't know if it was a political thing, but whatever. Yeah, it's, it's a, it was. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. So it, I think the people that are gonna stop the contamination short of everybody buying certified compostable packaging, which is our dream, Actually, to be all reusable, but you know, <laughs> next one is all of you. It's really everybody in this room that's going to stop that. So, in all of the municipalities that have a residential program, it's the volunteers that are signing people up and explaining that. So we have a special starter kit that people buy from the, the village. The village buys them and 
sells them in bulk at cost. But the really important part is we don't just give these away. We don't just show up at people's doors and put these down, which is what New York City did. And New York City has a ton of contamination problems. So everybody in Scarsdale who gets one of these and who participates is getting a little spiel, whether it's from a volunteer or a person in the municipality. Now, most of the people who get signed up end up talking to a volunteer. So everybody gets between a two and seven minute little overview about why you need to take that PLU sticker off or why plastic is different than biodegradable, which is different than compostable. We try to make it really easy. We have a sticker so they can see all this. We give them a guide. If we have it in four languages that we're happy to share with people that tells you everything that you can go and you can go, go in. And we check in the beginning. You know, that was very important because we don't want to send a contaminated stream. So Michelle and I would check, and it works really, really well. And how much does this, um, I know it's, it's affordable, I know you guys have done this, but to, just so for the audience, tell them how much it costs to, so, you have to buy them, right? Right, so what happens is the village of Scarsdale purchases these bins in bulk, because they can get it much cheaper, and then residents buy them at cost from the village. So this little bin, it comes with a roll of compostable bags, these are BPI certified compostable bags, the big bin, and the guide is all $20. And if you went on Amazon, it would be about $50. And so we wanted to make it easier for them. We also tested all these bins to make sure they're really good quality. And a note about the bags. So the village sells these at cost for about half the price of what a retailer would sell them. The reason that they do that, aside from just being a convenience, is that we don't want somebody going to a store and just saying, oh, I need, I need a bag, I, maybe biodegradable, or I'm not sure what I need. Okay. So this helps reduce the contamination so from the wrong plastic bags. Right. And do they need plastic bags? Can't you, can't you go and dump it without? So okay, we, look at the look at his face. We, we do <laughs> not require you to use a bag. You do not have to use a kit. You can bring it in a old yogurt container if you'd like. However, in our experience, 99% of people want the bin, they want it a good bin, they want to use the bags. Right. Okay, just just sure. Any, anything from you guys on? Because um, I, I just keep hearing these stories. I, I, all you guys have heard the story from me already, but when I grew up in Philadelphia, we did this just routinely, no bags. <laughs> I don't know, I'm so old, they didn't have plastic bags. Um, but my grandmother did this. In Philadelphia, we had curbside pickup. Um, I think it, came, it actually got, I think it was related to the war effort. I mean, this was, it went to the farms and they made money off it. The city of Philadelphia made money on people's scraps. And to this day, my mother, who was eight, I won't tell you, but she's in her 70s, still has a little triangular little thing like that in her sink. So when she's made, preparing dinner, the scraps go right there. And she did, she, it, talk about muscle memory. She just, this is just the way she does it. So it's interesting to see us reinventing the wheel on so many of these things um, when we know it can be done, absolutely that. I just, in terms of uh, one person or two people making a difference, uh, Ron and Michelle um, are I, I, local heroes and maybe even beyond local heroes, but they very generously um, met with people in Mamaronek and I was one of the people, our town supervisor, and the timing was right because we had Karen Kaur and Arlene um, who had read the Pope's encyclical uh, looking to you know, deal with, with climate change. And we had our sustainability collaborative, but we had people communicating. And, it, and, and, I, and I really cannot underscore the importance of community here because now we have a program. Now I think you are more successful than us because you're in the schools. And I firmly believe that we need to be doing this in our schools because kids take it home, and then they teach our parents, and it all works. But, but when we talk about one or two people making a difference, you have truly made a difference, and I thank you. I thank you. Thank you for you know, bringing it to the large one of the Maronite, because it's all of us together that's going to push the county. And it's going to help. Working on it. You know, it's going to help the state enact legislation when they see everybody doing it at the grassroots level.
So speaking of the county, tell, tell us a little bit more, Braden, about how this thing works. So we, I think we get a picture of you know, how we use the whole vegetable and so forth, and we work in the schools, and that we get it hopefully to the, the, the local facility, or it's even picked up. Then what happens? What's the, how's the magic? Uh, so just to clarify, sustainable materials management is a private company, um, but it is also the first Compost, a food waste compost facility in Westchester County. Um, it's not it's, it's not a very complicated process. Uh, basically, we are creating the ideal environment for the bacteria and the fungi who are our powerhouses of decomposition in nature to do it at an accelerated rate and in a way that is uh, safe and hygienic. So basically, the two streams of incoming material that we accept, it's uh, food scraps uh, and yard and tree debris. Um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with composting, goes by the browns and the greens, mix those in, in the right ratio, and it happens. You, you know, uh, we are uh, employing a technology called aerated static bays or piles, basically, um, like us, these organisms need, they need water, they need air, and they need food. Um, air is the key thing because um, this is an aerobic process, it requires oxygen, so underneath all of our compost uh, piles, we call them, is uh, perforated piping that's hooked up to a blower so that when we mix our uh, food waste with our ground up yard and tree debris, uh, which we call bulking agent, essentially mulch and wood chips. Um, like I said, not very complex. Uh, put it on top of the pipes, which are hooked up to a blower, which uh, force air through it at a regulated period of time. So, sure. so I want to say, I really just want to see what this looks like, though. So where are you based? Uh, you we are based in Portland Manor, New right. York. Right? So you drive up. Right, and there's like big piles of things that's behind the what was it? Uh, well, the, the facility building. itself is not um, the building. It's no, outside. It's, it's, it's outside. outside. Right. It's outside. Okay. Imagine you know, um, well, a series of three wall concrete bays, mm -hmm. um, like you see at landscape. Uh, right. Or, or, or mulch. Mulch piles. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Right. Ours right. was longer. Right. A little bit taller. Right. And um, it. From the, you know, just from looking at it, it just looks like a big mound mulch of mulch yeah. and food waste mixed together. You know, we uh, will be employing the use of old compost or wood chips as a natural biofilter to mitigate um, pests and odors. Right. Uh, but, you know, you're fermenting. It's like no, you're no, we are aerobically decomposing okay. uh, this organic material. So it's a start, are you saying you use some, some kind of starter? There is no starter. Everything we need exists naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, the bacteria, the fungi, you know, the spores, the you know, they're, they're just there. You mm -hmm. mix the food waste with mm -hmm. your wood chips slash mulch, mm -hmm. and it happens when it's done correctly. Well, wow. can you explain? Yeah, sorry. Economics. Economics. Can you explain the economics? Well, uh, it's a fantastic business model. Uh, people pay you to accept what they consider waste we turn it into a product and then sell it back to you guys. And this product is a value-added product. It is, uh, it enriches our soil, it cleans our water, and it helps our plants grow. You know, it's uh, really beneficial on all ends. There's another question? Yeah. I have a couple questions for both Ron and um, mm -hmm. Brian and Jim. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's okay, I'll talk loud. So I'm, just, I'm trying to get just clear a little bit. So, if I'm um, asking you to repeat. So are you, is your business through the town of Scarsdale or are you an independent company? That's my, that's, that's one question. I'm just a volunteer. You're just a volunteer. So myself and uh, another Scarsdale resident, her name is Michelle Sterling. Okay. Uh, everything that we're talking to you about, we do as volunteers. And everything you see from the stickers to the guides to where we got this stuff, we just give away to others. So who are you, who is participating? Just residents in Scarsdale, are there? So the, the, the municipal program is run by the village. So it was a joint program started with the Sustainability Committee and the village of Scarsdale. It is a municipal operation. So just like 
You could bring to a recycling center bottles and cans. You could bring, I'll show you, your People food scraps. bring their compost somewhere. It's not picked up by the town of Scarsdale. It is now. So originally, you would bring it to our recycling center, right here, which is also where you bring bottles, cans, garbage, and we set up a drop-off site, and happy custom. <laughs> and um, then we launched curbside pickup about three months ago. So you can see, there's a truck, it's a municipal truck. It's all done through the municipal operations. In Scarsdale, as most of Westchester, the municipality picks up trash and recycling. Some places in Westchester do private pickup. That would be handled separately. But um, now you just put the bin to the curb and they pick it up. They're picking up with their recycling and garbage. Correct. Right. Well, separate. Separate rep. Okay. Now where, I was gonna say, that's what Philly did. You put the, the, the little garbage can like this big on your curb once a week and they, they pick it up. That's okay. exactly how it Many municipalities and other ones have done this. Yeah, I know San Francisco does it in New York City. Yeah. So, Brandon, 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 so who are the people that are bringing compost to you? Like, are those businesses, are those individuals? How do they find you? Are they towns? Like, yeah. So, um, as a uh, registered uh, processing facility, we accept waste from licensed registered haulers. Uh, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation um, is the regulatory body that gives permits and registrations for uh, waste hauling companies uh, and municipalities. You know, everyone has to be licensed and registered um, to you know, make sure they're following all the regulations. So uh, certified waste haulers like CRP Sanitation or Suburban Carding or you know any of the private companies in Westchester that offer an organics service, just like they offer trash and recycling, are able to bring the waste that they collect to our facility. Um, so towns are towns if they want to haul it themselves are more than welcome. You know, uh, also uh, you know as part of community engagement, we will be operating an on-site food scrap drop-off site. So similar, actually almost identical to what I did at the New York County Florida in the Bronx, or what Ron does, or is set up in Scarsdale, and the other 10 municipalities that are doing this. If you live close enough, you know, you'll have the opportunity to bring your scraps directly to us. Okay. I asked, I live in Greenwich, Connecticut, and um, I started or collaborating on an organization called Greenwich Sustainable Food. And as we're trying to build bridges within Greenwich around people who are working on sustainability and food, compost and food waste just comes up and up and up. And we're just trying to figure out how to get the residents of Greenwich. And it feels like so easy in some communities. And here's Rye Country Day, like composting all the lunches. And like here we are as a town, it just feels very complicated. So I'm just trying to like figure out who the entities are and why this isn't something that just everyone just puts those three scraps on their corner and the town comes to pick it up and then and where does it go? And I think that's where I think it all gets a little a little lost. So just so you don't know Darien, Connecticut is yeah. about to start. Okay, so curbside composting, I just did a zero tried to for the most part it was a zero um, waste uh, event and we used curbside composting and he came and picked up the food scraps and we had to divide the food scraps in one bin and then all the compostable tabletop items in another bin and apparently they went to two different facilities within Connecticut. So I was surprised don't to do see that. Yeah, I was surprised to see that everything was just one one stream. So that depends on the facility where it's going. Not all, right. facilities, not all facilities accept the same thing. And um, the same ones, yeah. So you know, depending on where the waste is headed, we'll determine how it gets sorted at the generator level. So that. he has a business. He's going around. Yeah, yeah. His waste goes yeah. to New England Compost in Danbury, and they take uh, horse manure and, and waste and then kitchen scraps. They can't take both like Braden can. Right. So mm -hmm. that has to go to a separate place. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, that's what we brought. That's, and he did that. He, he you know, he, absolutely did that. But I really hope this conversation is going to continue at five o'clock upstairs when we have the tables and the exhibits and stuff. That would be great. That's what that's going to be for. I, I wonder if you want to continue Q&A or do you want to keep talking more? Uh, I have one, just one last one thing I wanted to ask him. It was about, I think this is a statewide thing. But this keeps coming up that the way people not just use 
compost, but actually use it as energy. And so I know that, for example, I just was reading today, because Paris has started a municipal collection program, so it's more apartment dwellers and that sort of thing. And then Angie, the, uh, the energy company, is they're going to actually sell this, not to pigs this time, pig farmers, but to use to actually manufacture energy from it. Are we doing, I know, and didn't you say, we, we don't we do something like that on the county level? Well, we, we burn our waste and then it, uh, which is mostly moisture and it, and it creates steam, but it also creates it's a steam sand. generator. But there's other formats, right, for doing this? Yeah, so I think what you're talking about is anaerobic digestion. And we all have anaerobic digesters right in our stomachs. And so the, yikes. And so, um, right, it's, it's another way to process organics. And the result of that, a lot of it is methane approximately half. A lot of it is carbon dioxide. And so they can separate the methane from the carbon dioxide and that's an energy source. Um, and so we're saying that climate change impacts? So, and so when you have methane or any uh, carbon-based fuel and you burn it, you're producing carbon dioxide. So, which is, we all know is a greenhouse gas, but when that, if it was going to a landfill, now you're producing methane that typically is not burnt. Um, a lot of the methane in the state of New York is captured in because there's landfill gas capture technology in most of our landfills, but not all of it gets captured. A lot of it ends up going to the air. So you know, one of the challenges of oh, should we do this anaerobic digestion or should we do composting is. What are the values that you're looking to get? If you're looking to feed soil, composting is better. There more of the organic matter is turned into compost than is turned into, for if you're doing anaerobic digestion, what's left over is called digestate, which can be land applied, often is, um, but it's, it's much less volume because you've captured a lot of that organics through the energy capture. Can we do both? You can do both, and in fact, there are facilities that will do anaerobic digestion and then compost that remainder sludgy stuff that we call digesting. And this is on a much bigger level, though. We're talking count yeah. countywide or large city. Generally, uh, the it's an expensive process, and so you need a larger facility like you're suggesting. There is some newer technology that's supposed to be more of a smaller batch system, but I haven't really seen that done much yet. There's a company in Tennessee called Proton. They do take, uh, I think, cellulose, and it's there is no harmful um, byproduct. It's mm -hmm. either water or charcoal or something that can be reused. You can look them up, Proton Tower, okay, out of Knoxville, Tennessee. That's great. So I guess the takeaway for everybody, just because we're running out of time, is just waste as little as possible. Enjoy your food. Okay, and with that, thank you so much, Pamela. Thank you, everybody.